I want to set out by, by setting the scene regarding the, the re regulatory uh, system that, that's in place. Um, as you're well aware, um, this is a, a, a very large topic, and, and so what, what I'm going to do is, is focus on, on four um, aspects of, of this. Uh, and initially, I will uh, set the scene um, simply by talking about the, the big picture. Uh, I, I will then focus on um, regulation of AGVAT chemicals. I will give a fairly brief, brief account of the regulatory framework that's involved. I will then, um, having contextualised all of that, I will move on and talk a little bit about what the future holds for the regulation of AGVAT chemicals. Some of this will be um, my, my own uh, thoughts. Most of it will be from a, a scientific perspective. Um, some of it, have, of course, has to be speculative, but we'll, we'll come to that. And finally, uh, I, I will conclude with uh, thoughts and the future prospects. So I will get underway uh, setting the scene with, uh, with part one. Uh, what I'd like to do is just contextualise the regulatory uh, landscape. As you're well aware, there's a very comprehensive web of regulatory frameworks. Uh, we, we regulate um, industry such as aviation. We regulate uh, issues such as land use. We, we regulate products such as GMOs. And these are just three examples. Uh, there's a very, very long list, and I'm sure you're well aware of the, the industries, the issues and the products that are regulated. So what I've done, we, we can't possibly capture the uh, comprehensive web of regulatory systems on, on this slide. I have simply depicted here just four of, four of those um, uh, products, if you like, uh, industrial chemicals, uh, food products, therapeutic goods and AGVET chemicals. Th there's a, a concept that comes through with, with these systems and that is there are three layers of government that can be involved. Uh, the, the slide shows local government can be regulating, not always, but in the case of food, for example, food products, it does. Uh, state regulators, and certainly that applies for, for uh, AGVAT chemicals as well as uh, therapeutic goods and, and, uh, and food, industrial chemicals. And then finally the, uh, the Commonwealth level. And that involves uh, agencies such as uh, NICNAS, FASANS, TGA, APVMA. There is a fourth level there. I've, I've marked it here with uh, councils and committees. And they're not always present but they are often present and they serve a very important role and it really relates to the uh, approval of a lot of the policies at, at a very, very high level. So today what I'm going to do is, is just focus now on uh, the regulation of uh, ag AGVET chemicals. So this takes me to part two of the presentation which is about the regulation of uh, AGVET chemicals. What we have in place, as, as I'm sure you're well aware, is a uh, legislative framework. Um, it comprises the AGVAT Chemicals Administration Act, and, and that establishes the APVMA as an independent statutory authority of the Commonwealth, uh, which is responsible for the regulation uh, and control of AGVAT chemicals in Australia, up to the point of retail sale. We also have the uh, AGVAT Chemicals Act 1994, and that uh, contains the constitutional and other legal provisions that enable the AGVAT Chemicals Code to have effect. The AGVAT Chemicals Products uh, Collection of Levies Act 1994 uh, contains measures that allow for the assessment and the collection of levies in regard to uh, AGVAT chemicals uh, that are registered uh, for use in Australia. And finally, the, probably the most important of, of our um, acts, which is the Ag and, and Vet Chemicals Code Act 94. And this contains the detailed provisions the, uh, for, for allowing the APVMA to evaluate, approve, register and review some active constituents and, and AgVet products. It also allows us to issue permits and to, to licence the manufacture of uh, uh, veterinary chemical products. 
state and territories are obviously uh, involved, as you know, through uh, the Control of Use program. Uh, that actually works through the states and northern territory, uh, both having enacted um, laws under the AGVET code as laws in their um, re uh, respective jurisdictions. The AGVET Chemicals Code Act 94 makes the AGVET code a law for the ACT and Norfolk Island. As noted in the, in the previous slide, the AGVET Chemicals Code, or the AGVET Code as we like to call it, provides for the approval of active ingredients, the registration of products and the approval of, of labelling. So when making a decision to grant or refuse an approval or a registration, the APVMA must decide whether the relevant statutory criteria uh, have been satisfied. So the APVMA refers to technical guidance, standards and guidance materials to, to assist to make such decisions and I'll address these in future slides. But when an um, active uh, constituent uh, is approved, the APVMA records the relevant particulate on the record of approved active constituents for chemical products, uh, commonly called the record. Likewise, when AGVET chemical products are registered, the relevant particulars are included on the register of agricultural and veterinary chemical products, which we call uh, the register. Um, likewise, um, when labels are approved, the prescribed information is entered into the relevant APVMA uh, product file. And the same with, uh, uh, with permits. Um, when permits are issued, they are recorded in the, the record for, for permits. The second part of this was the data guidelines and as I've said previously, applications need to address a range of criteria such as um, safety, efficacy and trade. And for the APVMA to, to grant an approval or registration, it must be satisfied that the applicant's data and information meets all the criteria relevant to the particular uh, product or active. So data guidelines are really, uh, they're relevant considerations for decision makers. However, the statutory criteria will always prevail such that the, the data guidelines uh, are, are not determinative uh, of, of applications. Standards and guidance materials is another aspect of the, of the uh, regulatory framework. The APVMA routinely establishes standards for new active constituents and it also revises existing standards. These may come as a result of uh, chemical reviews or they may come from input from uh, external um, bodies, organisations, etc. Et uh, typically, the standard will specify minimum purity of an active constituent, uh, ratios of, uh, of uh, isomers, um, if, if that's relevant, maximum level of, of impurities, uh, including those of uh, toxicological uh, significance. The IPVMA uh, ad adopts certain international standards, such as the chemistry specifications that are shown here, the FOA, FAO standards and specifications for pesticide active constituents and associated products, and on the, 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 the veterinary medicine side, the, the various uh, pharmacopoeia standards. Relevant international technical guidance materials are adopted by the APVMA uh, data guidelines and these assist uh, applicants uh, with satisfying the legislative criteria that I've, uh, that I've mentioned. Finally, the Agricultural and Veterinary Chemicals Code uh, allows for various post-registration activities the two major ones are uh, chemical review and uh, compliance. In terms of chemical review, uh, as, as new information uh, becomes available, uh, which could be associated with, with risk, uh, the APVMA is able to um, re review that, that data to, to make sure and ensure the chemical can continue to be used safely and effectively. The AGVAT code uh, also uh, provides for a range of powers to deal with non-compliance. 
and a range of regulatory actions can be taken to control the product risk. I'd like to now move on to the, the third part of my presentation, uh, what does the future hold for AgVet chemical regulation? Uh, clearly there's been an explosion of technological advances in multiple fields in recent years. These fields include analytical chemistry, computational sciences, molecular biology, genomics, material engineering. So projecting these technological advances on our current knowledge base provides a realistic approach to predicting product types of the future. However, we, we have to realise that um, market forces uh, determine whether these predictions come to fruition or not. So in a sense, what I'm about to say has a certain degree of speculation associated with it. So the future product types. Already we are seeing products of nanotechnology, uh, products of biotechnology, uh, biopesticides, and, and there are some more specialised things such as stem cell therapies and gene therapies. And I'll just very briefly uh, provide an account of some of these things. In terms of uh, products of uh, nanotechnology, th this is an area that is really exploding and we're going to hear a lot more about this from our, our, the next two speakers. Um, what I've listed here are some of the uh, nano formulations, the um, the polymer-based nano formulations are sort of depicted by this this graphic. The magenta in in here are the is the uh, active constituent. Um, we've got inorganic nanoparticles such as this porous hollow uh, silica nanoparticle. Again, the yellow is the, is the nanoparticle and the um, magenta here is, is actually the active constituent. Um, we're going to hear more about nanoclays uh, later this morning, uh, various micelles, emulsions, dispersions, some of these sorts of things and liposomes which are shown up here. Uh, there's, there's, there's dendromers, there's carbon nanotubes, and, and there's quite a lot of um, co-formulants now that are coming um, or being developed. A lot of this is still in R&D. A lot of it is very important for precision agriculture, but um, it, it allows so many functions, such as um, changing toxicity profiles, uh, uh, re, you know, controlled release, drug targeting and all of these sorts of things and overall it, it allows for a reduced environmental footprint. The second group I mentioned were these products of uh, biotechnology. This is really a field that is going ahead in leaps and bounds. Um, what, I've, what this slide shows is simply uh, interference RNA um, or post-transcriptional gene silencing as it's properly called. Um, we, we think that this evolved as a, a, a mechanism, a defence mechanism against viruses. Basically, this depicts um, a, a cell. Uh, what you have here is uh, nucleus and, um, and transcription with the messenger RNA. It's, it's coming out. We have um, double-stranded RNA, uh, small interference RNA. We have this complex where this uh, interference uh, RNA is actually binding and forming it this uh, RNA-induced uh, silencing complex, and you can see that the, the RNA that was um, uh, uh, translated has, has been chopped up, and so if that's encoding for a protein in a, in a pest, for example, that is, is, is going to uh, lead to the, the destruction of that pest. You, you can see there's an issue here, for, uh, particularly for regulators, because um, most of these frameworks have been designed for conventional chemicals, and where some of this is going is more towards uh, biotechnology. And, and so that is going to be an issue that we really have to stay across. Uh, we, we, we've seen quite a few uh, biopesticide products come, come through the system and are already approved. I've just listed four major groups here. Uh, the um, biochemical pesticides such as the pheromones, there are various plant and other extracts 
some of the um, oils, for example. There's a, a, a group of microbial agents um, consisting of uh, bacteria, fungi, viruses, protozoa. And then there's various other um, organisms. And one of the big advantages of biopesticides is that they are less environmentally toxic uh, compared to conventional pesticides. Generally, they, they target the, the, the pest and closely related organisms very well. They're short, they, 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 they tend to have a shorter residual time uh, in the environment and, and they f align very well with some of the integrated pest management programs. So we, we feel there's quite a big uh, future for biopesticides. We, we are dealing with uh, stem cell therapies. Um, this is, you know, we, we see a lot of this on television and uh, it, it gets a lot of uh, quite negative press because of the uh, sort of uh, lack of evidence that supports some of the claims that are being made and some of the practices. Uh, they are mostly in the human field. But at the same time, um, there are reports in the literature now where uh, stem cells, for example, have been harvested from, from fat or from bone marrow um, or from umbilical cord. And they are then uh, activated uh, with platelet um, um, enriched plasma and, and light and they are injected, for example, into joints with uh, osteoarthritis, dogs, for example, with osteoarthritis. So some of this uh, technology is already happening, but it's, it's at a very, very early stage. But it is something that we're going to have to um, be across as, as time moves on. A, a second one in a similar category are, 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 are gene therapies. Um, there has always been issues relating to delivery of gene therapy because of the viruses and the, the, the risks that can be posed by viruses. Um, uh, nanoparticles can be used as delivery systems, as can plasmids. I've shown the, uh, the mechanisms um, in this panel to the right, where we're simply um, inactivating a, a, a mutated gene, the, the yellow bit there. Uh, we can be introducing uh, a new gene or we can be replacing a mutated gene. So the, there are various mechanisms how gene therapies work. Uh, if you've been following the literature, there was a recent report on a uh, immunocontraceptive in dogs, where, for example, uh, the, it, the, the, the gene was actually delivered using a, a virus that cannot replicate, and so it was very safe. And then what it was doing was generating uh, or encoding for uh, antibodies that uh, upset the um, hypothalamic pituitary uh, gonad uh, uh, axis in both male and female. So, so that is progressing. So there's a number of these things, but we're sort of in the main that they're in R&D and we're looking at, into the future. So the other th aspect that we have to look at for the future are these um, innovative uh, test methodologies. Uh, most of the advances that we're seeing in these test methodologies, f well, for the most part, anyhow, uh, fall into uh, two categories. Either they're driven by cellular and molecular biology uh, advances or by um, computational science. And I've listed uh, under each of those just some examples. The uh, omic technologies, induced pluripotent stem cells, lab on chip technologies, and then under computational science we have things such as bioinformatics, computational toxicology, and some of the in silico um, uh, models. And I'll, I'll very quickly uh, t take you through some of these things. Basically, um, if, if you're not familiar with omics technologies, omics is really a suffix. And it depends on whether you're working on the genome, in which case it's gen uh, genomics. Um, if you're working on uh, proteins, it would become proteomics. So the omics is always a suffix. And so ba basically what this slide is showing is simply uh, it, it's, it's primarily looking at expression of, of some of these genes. And so what we're doing here is extracting messenger RNA. So it's already been expressed. Then what we're doing is uh, reverse transcription poly, uh, polymerase chain reaction 
producing a, a complementary DNA. Um, this lot here, these cells have been um, uh, treated with a chemical that's under test. This is the control. And so we can label these differently, uh, different colours, uh, fluorescent labels, combine equal parts of that. We uh, probe with the, the, the DNA. So we're sort of getting into this uh, microarray, and it always reminds me of the, um, the adaptation from um, uh, inkjet printers, because most of this technology has been adapted from, from there, and basically what it's allowed is for uh, oligonucleotides to be um, imprinted on a glass slide, and, and that was sort of the origin of some of this. And basically, um, the process then allows you to differentiate between uh, whether you've got overexpression, underexpression, or, or no, no effect on expression. So it's that, that sort of thing. But there are many, many combinations of this. That's just, just one of them. Uh, you could be looking for mutations, for example. It would be a different design to that. But that's getting into detail. Uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. About uh, probably what, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, um, we were told that once a cell differentiated, it couldn't. It was a one-way process. Um, that has since been disproved. In fact, it can. It's a two-way process. And so, what you can do here is start with these uh, adult cells, such as the um, fibroblasts that you could ru rub off your um, forearm, for example. You can reprogram them to produce these uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, you can have differentiation using various growth factors and, and different factors to produce something like um, nervous cells or red blood cells or whatever sort of cells you, you wish to um, 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 develop. And, and of course, these are from humans. And so instead of using um, cells from, let's say, rats or something in, in the test for, for toxicity, you'd be using human cells. And so you're getting rid of a uh, e extrapolation uh, between species. Uh, the, an, another uh, modern uh, one is the uh, organ on a chip or lab on a chip. Basically, uh, with, with human organ on a chip technology these days, um, it, it's, it's no longer as simple as looking at um, the transport of a chemical between the blood supply or across the, the, the vessel wall. These days, you can use uh, things that mimic peristalsis in the gut or the inflation, deflation of lungs using various vacuum operated systems. And, and of course, uh, that is generating um, data in, in vitro, and uh, it's, it's really applying the three R principles, the uh, you know, re re uh, replacement, reduction, refinement, uh, in terms of animal research um, and, and ethics, welfare, etc. So it's, it's, it's a really good thing, but obviously it, it, it poses some problems for uh, regulators. Bioinformatics is a is a, a massive field and it's 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 growing exponentially. Um, I've I've just popped up a, a couple of points here. Uh, one is the extrapolation from mes measured dose response in cell-based uh, systems to human exposure. Uh, some of the integrated data analysis, pathway-based toxicity, and I'll show you one of those in a in a, in a moment to sort of show you the uh, complexity. Um, comparison of DNA sequences. Well, we just looked at um, some of the um, omics technologies and, as I said, with a variation of what I showed you, you could make that into a system that would detect uh, mutations. And, of course, I've mentioned um, earlier about interference RNA and bioinformatics is really important in, in that field because you have to design and select um, double-stranded RNAs that will knock out insects but, but not non-target organisms. And so you, you've got this safety factor there for the off-target organisms as well. Computational toxicology uh, is, is, is a big field, um, involves a tremendous amount of mathematics and, and really does take very specialised um, individuals uh, to, to, to be able to work with some of those, uh, the, the, the models, which can be quite complex. So. The other part, particularly from a, a, a regulatory authority's perspective, uh, is risk assessment methodologies. Um, this, this is a, a, a big field. Um, of, of course, the 
uh, knowledge base for all of these new technologies is growing fairly rapidly. Uh, every, every, every week we find out there's, there's been another uh, the discovery that could be uh, important in, in a risk assessment. Uh, it doesn't matter whether the, the subject matter is uh, nanotechnology or biotechnology or some of the stem cells and so forth. It, we, we are learning all the time. Uh, and it's, as I said, the, the technological advances are really have exploded in the last number of years. Interpretation of results generated by the novel testing methodologies. Uh, again, I'll show you a toxicity pathway in a moment and that'll sort of bring that out. Uh, and modelling. Um, we have uh, quite, quite a number of models. Um, the, um, the Department of in Environment and Energy, for example, have a very good system they call IMAP, which uh, is the inventory for multi-tiered assessment and uh, prioritisation framework. And basically they have a huge number of uh, industrial chemicals to, to, to screen. And, and so they can, you know, it would take many, you know, a lifetime to get through this work. Whereas with this IMAP, they can get through the, through the work in, in a matter of um, months. Um, we're also working on, or not working on, we've already implemented um, Metapath. And Metapath is, is a, a model that identifies um, metabolites. So it's particularly important in food safety evaluations where you're trying to identify the, um, the, the metabolites that should be, in, should be looked at closely. The, uh, the Im image here is just uh, sh showing robots doing some of this work. Uh, it's called high throughput screening. And, and basically, uh, a, a decade or two decades ago, we might only get through a couple of dozen uh, assays in a day. These things can get through 100,000 in a day. Um, what, what they do is they, they use something like the omics technologies that I showed earlier, but the, 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 the difficulty or the challenge for us is to make sure that what's being measured is, is actually um, valid and, and the, supports the claim that is being made. So the international and national agencies, including APVMA, uh, have all adopted this um, conventional risk assessment framework that's shown here. Uh, you can see it comprises four parts. Problem formulation, which uh, um, Dr. Kirkham is going to speak about next. Um, we've got hazard and, and, and exposure, as, as you know. Uh, risk is, is a function of hazard and exposure. The issue for regulators is that we have to understand the, the fundamentals so that we can really um, uh, appreciate the, the degree of complexity and, and what, what's involved with um, hazard and exposure. This is the uh, toxicity pathway that I've been referring to. Uh, it, it shows here that we, we have on the, uh, on the cell membrane, if you like, uh, various receptors or uh, enzymes. They react di directly with a, a chemical. You have various pathways. Uh, initially, you have um, uh, increase um, uh, uh, tra translation. Um, so this is all done in the in the nuclear in the nucleus. Then you you see some sort of a cellular effect uh, as, as a result of that expression happening, and then eventually the, um, the the tissue or the organ or the whole organism shows some sort of toxicity uh, endpoint. So if we were to add a chemical, um, you, you sort of you might see something like that. And from a regulatory point of view, the question, of course, is, you know, you could, you could have um, 100,000 of these things and you've got to figure out, they're all making claims, but you've got to figure out whether, um, j j just because um, the, you know, the omics technologies came into play here uh, and it lit up the, the fluorescence on your plate, does that really indicate what, the, what is being claimed? So, so that's quite very, very challenging. Because, as I said, you don't just have a handful of these things. You could have, you know, 100,000 of them. So it, it, it's very, very complicated. Regulatory considerations. Um, the, the, the most I can do with regulatory considerations is 
point out at the very <coughs> beginning that this is done on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, that's the approach that's used. So when I uh, put up these, these various um, considerations, they might apply in, in one discipline, but they don't apply in another, uh, or for one product, but they don't apply with the um, assessment of another. So in the, in the case of, uh, let's say, nanomaterials, it's essential that the physicochemical properties uh, are very well characterised. About a, a, a decade ago, we would read the literature and we would find that some of the reports didn't agree with other reports. The reason for that was we, we were comparing apples and oranges because the uh, materials had been um, uh, synthesised differently, for example, and they were really, even though it was minute, they were different materials. And so, yeah, of course, you, you couldn't expect the same results. Um, uh, uh, dose metrics is becoming all important. A, 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 again, if you've got something that's very, very tiny, um, it may not be the, the weight or the mass that's important. It could be the surface area. Um, and, and so that, of course, impacts on the dose response curves. Um, bioinformatics we've been into, it's particularly important with the biotechnology products where we, that I, I showed with the uh, interference RNA. Um, in, in vitro, in vivo correlations, very important with uh, some of the toxic, toxicity testing. Um, it, you know, for, for, for example, uh, in vitro, the particles could agglomerate or aggregate or something like that. In vivo, that doesn't happen. So if you're trying to extrapolate from one to the other, the correlation is going to be particularly bad. Uh, experimental me methodology, uh, spinning could give you a very r different result to ultrasonication. Uh, for example, with na na again nanoparticles, ultrasonication actually um, can destroy or change the particles, whereas spinning or vortexing may not. Um, uh, choice of cell type. Um, mammalian cell types are, are, are used for genotoxicity testing. Uh, you wouldn't use bacterial cell types for that on, a, on account of them not taking up the um, test substance. And there's, there's many, many health, safety and environmental issues that I, I can't go into. But as I said, it, it all depends on the um, product under consideration. So the I've just got one slide on my um, thoughts about this and future prospects. This is very, very much from a, a scientific perspective. Um, the most important thing um, is that we are very responsible about the introduction of novel technologies into agriculture and, 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 and animal husbandry. Um, that is of paramount importance. If we mess that up, uh, it, it, it'll take a long time to re recover. In order to do that, um, regulatory frameworks must be based on sound science. Um, we, we have seen, um, particularly from, from uh, other agencies, various policies that have been introduced that, that don't make a lot of sense from a scientific perspective. Generally speaking, the existing regulatory framework is adequate in the short term. But it is going to need refining as we move on because our knowledge base is being extended. New tools and technologies are going to require specialist expertise. But at the same time, we have to retain the general expertise. We have to bring them both together. And I've shown you some of the things to do with bioinformatics and some of those things, where it could be a mathematician who's required, for example not necessarily a, a cellular or molecular biologist. And finally, uh, advancing regulatory science is a, is a global endeavour. Uh, IPVMA is involved, active participant in that, and, and in my view, uh, must continue to, to be so. So I'll stop with that. Thank you very much.